Okay, this is lecture 16 on quadrature amplitude modulation reception. We'll talk about different building blocks in the receiver. This follows a uh, two part lecture on quadrature amplitude modulation transmission. This is the spring 2014 class of the real time digital signal processing lab at the University of Texas at Austin. So, this is a two part lecture as well. So, we'll talk about lots of things uh, in this discussion. So, we'll talk about a lot of the really adaptive systems, quite honestly, in the receiver to make reception as accurate as possible. And the essential idea is that for every impairment in the channel and every impairment in the analog front ends of the transmitter and receiver, we have to adjust for or compensate for in the receiver. And we have a lot of work to do in the receiver, a lot more work to do than in the transmitter. Sometimes three times more, four times more, depends on the particular modulation method. For QAM, it's easily three to four times more than a QAM transmitter. For PAM, it's more like two to, two to three X. PAM is a little more easy, to, a little easier to implement. Okay, so here's some of the building blocks we'll look at today. Look at automatic gain control. This handles fading in the channel. Uh, carrier detection, we have to know when transmission is happening and if it has been occurring, when does it stop? When is, when is the connection hung up or done? And also, when does that connection begin? Both are important. Uh, simple clock recovery, you've done a homework on this already. We'll talk a bit more about another method. This particular method is not, uh, does not have an adaptive filter in it, so it's kind of an interesting way to do it. But it uses feedback nonetheless. Uh, channel equalization, we also do homework seven on that, which I'll assign later today. And finally, when all these impairments are corrected for, then we can finally talk about QAM demodulation, which is just uh, modulation by a cosine and sine, and then applying the appropriate low-pass filter to extract baseband. So that's the easy part in all of this. The hard part is all the other stuff that has to happen just right before that. Okay, so we had a lecture 12 on channel impairments, and we went over several of them. We talked about uh, linear uh, distortion, look about linear time invariant distortion. In particular, this is a frequency response in the channel. It's going to distort magnitude and phase. We talked about linear time varying only as it affects to changing the phase as a function of time. We talked, a, we haven't talked that much about nonlinear distortion, but we've talked about using uh, squaring blocks and blocks that take the input to the fourth power for things like preemphasis. But, and so that's where we're using nonlinearities to our advantage. But in practice, because of power amp amplifiers in the system and low noise amplifiers in the, so power amplifiers in the transmitter, low noise amplifiers in the receiver, we will pick up uh, with some nonlinear distortion issues. Also, this happens when we go through D to A and A to D conversion. There's a little bit more to that story. We also, so we haven't talked that much about it, but that will come up a little bit more in detail when we do data converters. We have talked a lot about additive noise, and generally we assume that that follows a Gaussian distribution. And again, the Gaussian is a model. It's a model. It's a model. I'll say it again. It's a model. It's not reality. Gaussian noise in practice. The noise observed in practice is not exactly Gaussian, but it's close. If you look at background noise in particular, it's close to Gaussian. Now, there's some other kinds of noise and interference that don't follow Gaussian distributions at all. They follow other things. Okay, and we won't talk about, you know, Rayleigh and Ricean distributions or uh, symmetric alpha stable or Gaussian mixture models. But there are plenty of other models out there that handle other kinds of impairments, many that are short-lived or have to do with uh, electromagnetic scattering properties in the system or in the channel and so forth. For us, all of our additive noise uh, will be assumed to be Gaussian. But again, it's a model, and it's really good for background noise, but it's a model. It's not exactly what happens in practice, but it's close for background noise. Now, there's also an, an issue to deal with, which is essentially the mismatch between the receiver analog front end and the transmitter analog front end. So the transmitter analog front end are going to have things like up conversion, power amplification, and some, some interface to the channel. So if it's a wireless transmission, it's going to be an antenna. If it's an acoustic transmission, there'll be an trans acoustic transducer. If there's a wire, a wire line transmission, there'll be some sort of line interface. There'll be voltage changes, power amplification, lots of sources of. We also know there'll be probably up conversion, um, which will have another source of, of errors to it. So there's a lot of things going on 
in the transmitter, and the receiver really needs to match what's happening at the transmitter. And the receiver is really seeing a signal that is coming out of the transmitter, but then going through a channel. So the receiver is seeing a, even I have, if I have, and I will have transmitter impairments, those are then altered by the channel. They likely will get worse as they go through the channel. Okay. Now, in the receiver, we're going to have a subsystem that's really tuned to each impairment that we're facing. And I don't, this is not a, com a complete list, but it's a pretty, pretty good list. It's uh, lots of the stories here. All right, so if we look at uh, this, if we happen, if we ta we've talked about propagation of channels over, uh, propagation of signals over a channel over a medium, and you're going to experience some fading. And this fading has got a couple of ways to look at it. We know that at the very least we're going to have some convolution effects from the channel. We know there'll be some part of the channel that's linear and time invariant. That means that we get spreading in time and we get frequency distortion. We'll deal with that later in linear distortion. Separate from that, we also have multiplicative uh, change in gain due to fading. And you know this from talking on the phone. You know it from listening to, to uh, broadcast radio, if you still do that. You'll see fading in and out as you go in different parts of, the, of a city, especially in the urban center, when you're in an urban canyon, canyon surrounded by very tall buildings. As you move around in the streets, you'll get fading in and out of signal strength. So we really want to be able to track that and apply the appropriate gain at the receiver automatically, not with any manual inter intervention, automatically increase or decrease the gain to keep the voltage values in range of our quantizer and the analog to digital converter. We don't want to go out of range. We don't want to get too small in voltage. We'd like to hit as best we can the full range of the quantizer. If the quantizer works from minus 3 volts to plus 3 volts, we'd like to have the voltage in the signal by the time it hits the quantizer to be in that range, in the full range. We don't want to squash it down to near zero. We don't want to have it plus or minus 10 volts because it will clip. So the fading has got some work. So the fading is corrected by automatic gain control, and there are lots of algorithms for that. Additive noise, we already know how to deal with that one. That's a match filter. And this match filter, so tell me about the match filter. How do I design the match filter? What do I do? It's a scaled version of the pulse shape. So if I know the pulse shape used by the transmitter, then the impulse response to the match filter is just a version of that pulse shape. It's a scaled, flipped, delayed, conjugated version, if you remember all that. Right? So if I know, if I know the... I'll just do it in, I'll do it in both. Here's continuous time. All right, so if I know the uh, match filter, so if I know the impulse, so if I know the pulse shape in the transmitter, then the impulse response of the match filter, the best I can do is this flipped, conjugated, delayed, and scaled version of the pulse shape. The pulse shape is G of T. That's the continuous time story. The discrete time story, which is the one we really are going to implement, both in MATLAB simulation and in, in lab, the discrete time version, we're, we're going to run the match filter, in this case, at the sampling, the sampling rate, not the symbol rate. So M is my, little, is my index. So I have a gain. That hasn't changed. Now what's the rest of this? What's the equivalent of little t in discrete time? Uh, sure. So if I were to sample, I, I want to sample. And remember, I also have this after sampling. It's symbol time is uh, yes. Okay. 
So the common, you know, the L times, uh, so the TSIM has capital L samples in it. The symbol time is capital L samples. For samples, you refer to the sampling rate. 1 over TS. All right. So if I want to make this completely discrete time, I'll go to square brackets, just to em emphasize that. Completely discrete time, so there's no seconds anymore. So my pulse shape is an impulse response. Or I think of it as an impulse response. It's a signal in time, in discrete time, that follows index little m. All right, so there's my sample index. Okay, so what's in the so what's the equivalent of TSIM in terms of samples? How many samples are in a symbol period? How many samples are in a symbol? L. Good. And what's a discrete time version of little t? Samples. M. That's it. Okay. In discrete time. So if I know the pulse shape in discrete time, G of T, then to get the best impulse response of the match filter in terms of maximizing some measure of signal-to-noise ratio, this peak pulse SNR, then I want to take the pulse shape in discrete time, flip it in discrete time, delay it by capital L samples, conjugate, and then scale by some number, some real number. And again, zeros. The theory says zero is fine, but practice says zero is silly. Nothing's getting through the filter. So k would not be zero in practice. But what this tells us is we have flexibility that any gain that we use will still allow us to maximize SNR at the sampling that happens at the output of the match filter. This allows us, this kind of tells us that this is good. Right? So we have flexibility. And the choice of the match filter gain. So whatever the automatic gain control decides to use is just fine by us at, at the match filter. Good. Any gain is just fine. All right, that's from a, just from the match filter point of view. OK, so again, the match filter helps us with additive noise. So linear distortion, this is really going to be, we really want to deal with linear, we really want to deal with linear time varying distortion, because in practice the channel will vary with time. It won't be constant. Its frequency response will vary with time. So we really want an equalizer that can track and compensate for this, these changes in time. So the equalizer is something that will be adaptive and follow or track the, the way the, the frequency response is changing, both magnitude and phase. Remember, for quadratory amplitude modulation, phase is very important. Way more important than it was in PAM. You really need to get the phase right. Okay, so the channel equalizer is going to be adaptive. Automatic gain control will be adaptive. Match filter is fixed. Right, that just depends on the pulse shape being used at the transmitter. It's fixed. Now we've also you've done homework on carrier recovery. So in practice, is this going to be adaptive or fixed? I just have to do it once and I'm done. All done. Yeah. So the, again, the channel is changing with time. It's changing the the. You can think of it if you want to think of it from electromagnetics. The scattering, absorption, all this is kind of varying a little bit with time, right? Just from motion. Just from motion. Right? Um, Trees swaying, cars moving. Just, it's just, it's just going to be changing with time. Now, the other question is, how fast does it change with time? And that does different channels change at different 
different speeds. So you have to know something about your channel. So in, in outdoor communications, you're changing quite often at a microsecond time scale. Indoors, a millisecond time scale. Wireline, perhaps a second time scale. So those are six orders of magnitude difference in time scales. So based on your system, you know how often you need to be adapting for these different quantities. Okay, so carry recovery, you've looked at that already. You've done carrier uh, frequency estimation and phase lock loop. So you've done this, you've done homework problems, tracking carrier frequency values and their accompanying phase values at the receiver. And we want to do this adaptively at some update rate. And symbol timing, which you've done as well in lab, right? And for lab five, I hope, because you turn the report in, the, you would have turned in the report unless you're in the Friday lab section, then it's shortly. Um, so the symbol re clock recovery, we're locked on to a different frequency and phase, and that is the symbol clock. So we're going to lock on either the half the symbol rate or the symbol rate, depending on the pulse shape that we use in the transmitter. All right, so the carrier recovery is going to lock on to the carrier frequency, FC. The carrier clock, the symbol clock recovery is going to lock on to the symbol uh, rate or half the symbol rate. And then you can do a squaring device to get it to the symbol rate. All right, so again, this is adaptive. So this is adaptive. So on the symbol um, clock recovery, we can do this every symbol period. We can ad adjust the symbol timing every symbol period. We could do it less often. Depends, you know, there's always a trade-off. The more often we do it, the more complexity we incur. But it is common to update this every, every clock, um, every symbol period. All right, so again, we've done, you've done homework on match filters, carrier recovery, you've done lab on symbol clock recovery, homework seven's on channel equalization, and I might add automatic gain control on the homework seven. Do that later today. But we'll talk about each of these today, and uh, as time permits, and we'll do the rest on Monday. Now, the order matters to these things in the receiver. And we'll, I'll show you the block diagram for this. So the order kind of, well, it does matter. Right, so let's talk about the block diagrams for both the transmitter. This is baseband transmission and baseband reception. doesn't include the analog front ends. And so, again, if you had to describe this class to somebody else, you'd be doing, really, we deal with baseband transmission and reception, transceivers, transceiver design. If you tell an employer that you did a modem design, then they're going to ask you about your analog front end design, which we haven't done. We've talked about the impairments. All right, so this is, in the, again, the baseband transceiver design for this class. And other things. We've done audio and other things, too. But for the communication side, baseband transceiver design. All right, so on the transmitter side, we've been through this. This is lab, you know, this is lab six, but it builds on earlier labs. And we've done this on previous, the previous uh, lecture, lecture 15. So again, we have a series of bits that come in. We group them into J bits. We look, you look up the, from those J bits, we look up the in-phase and quadrature amp, symbol amplitudes. We are now at the symbol rate. We upsample by L to get to the sampling rate. Go through the, the uh, pulse shaping filter on the transmit side. Up conversion at a small frequency, I guess of C. And this is a low frequency up conversion. So we still consider this baseband. We're still pretty close to zero in terms of content, where the power, where the spectral content is. And subtract the two and, and then put it through a digital analog converter to get our baseband continuous time signal out, little s of t. That's lab six the upper block diagram. Now, the, we did some analysis last time on the probability of symbol error, and, and in doing that, we made a lot of assumptions. 
In fact, we made a tremendous number of assumptions. What was the only impairment that we considered when we did the symbol error rate? Derivation. Just additive noise. It was the only impairment. We assumed synchronization, the receiver that was perfect. We assumed no memory in the channel or a metaphysically perfect equalizer in the receiver to get rid of that frequency-dependent distortion in the channel. We had no carrier mismatch. Right? This is QAM, right? So we had no... The receiver had exact carrier synchronization, so carrier frequency and phase. And we only focused in that derivation on this part of it, which is the final step. After all those adaptive <laughs> systems are doing their job correctly, then we can start talking about the final step, which is the QAM demodulation step. So this QAM demodulation step is what does the dual of what was in the, the block diagram up here. We just simply, um, up, well, we, we do sinusoidal demodulation with the cosine and sinusoidal demodulation with the sine. Uh, signal. Now, we have to be very careful here. We have a factor of two here just to compensate for the conversion from a bandpass signal to a baseband signal. We looked at that on a previous homework. Uh, but we had to decode the string. I wish I were Oscar Meyer Wiener. Just wanted to say that. Okay. All right. And then finally, uh, the gains are two. And then on the sine, S-I-N-E, we also have to get the S-I-G-N correct because on the transmit side, we have this negative sign. And I have made this mistake many times, forgetting that minus down there in the receiver. And if you've never made that mistake, it's okay. Give it time. At some point, you may make this mistake. I've seen books miss it. I've seen, you know, whatever. Yeah. All right. You'll know. You'll know when you miss it, when you implement. You'll know. All right. So that's the QM demodulation step. But there's a whole lot of stuff before the QM demodulation that we really got to get right. Um, so let's kind of go through this as a block diagram. So in the receiver, we'll have a receive signal. And this receive signal has gone through a channel. And this channel has got all these impairments. We've got, you know, basically a filter, additive noise. So the channel can be as complicated as we want. So there are all kinds of channel models possible. Right? So the simplest, right? So the simplest is just, you know, where would you start? The simplest possible channel model, where would you start? What's the easiest one? How about no impairments? Let's just start even simpler than, you know, no impairments, right? Just a wire. Right? That's, the, that's, that's where we, and that's a lot of the ho homework has been that. Ideal, I mean, an ideal channel in the most ideal possible way. All right, so that's the simplest. So the next thing we could do is additive noise. So that's kind of one choice. Second is additive noise. Then the only subsystem that really comes into play in the receiver is which one? Additive noise, what's the subsystem? The match filter. And where's the match filter in this block diagram? Well, tell me more. Which block in the QAM demodulation is the match filter? The low pass filter. So again, this low pass filter has three roles to play in one filter. Remember, we've talked about this. It's the demodulating filter, it's the match filter. It also plays a role in that what follows the low-pass filter is a sampling operation. So it's the anti-aliasing filter in front of the downsampling. And again, why use three low-pass filters in Cascade when one will do just fine? So what we tend to do is this tends to be the match filter playing three roles. Again, the three roles are demodulating filter, match filter, anti-aliasing filter. Now we're just going to and we're just going to define this as the match filter, and the reason we can get away with that is that up ahead of the low-pass filter, we have a channel equalizer. We have another filter in this story that we're going to adapt to the channel frequency response to try to compensate for the frequency distortion of the channel. This lightens the load on the low-pass filter. So we can just make the low-pass filter a match filter, and we're good. Even though the match filter is not 
necessarily has the best stop band attenuation in the world, but it's okay because we have an equalizer ahead of it. We'll clean up a lot of mess before we even get to the match filter. Okay. There are other filters in this story too, as you might guess. Right? You figure if this class is 50% about filtering, then probably a good guess that 50% of these blocks have filters in them, and actually it's a little higher than that. But this is the one that's directly on the signal path ahead of the low-pass filter. So the signal path is the path that the signal experiences from input to the final stages of... Right, so that's the signal path. And then there's a lot of stuff that happens off to the side to adjust the parameters that we need to apply the right uh, techniques, filtering, whatever it happens to be, along the signal path. There's a lot more to the story than just the signal path. All right, so a few sides of the story we've talked about already, so I'm going to have, a, a, let's go back to the very front end of this. So again, I have a lot of stuff in the analog front end I'm not showing you. I'm just showing you a piece of it. And the piece I'm showing, I'm not showing that there's an antenna or not. I'm not showing that there's a low noise amplifier. I'm focused here really on, you know, what do we, what's, what do we need to think about uh, for the design, for the base fan receiver. So first I have a receive filter. And tell me about the receive filter. What kind of frequency selectivity would it have? Bandpass, right? So I have bandpass transmission at the very least, right? So this is this is bandpass. Well, okay, so let's be careful. So I did call this baseband, so let me be consistent here. So this is baseband, but it is baseband in the sense that it's still, I don't have a DC component. And I'm going to go through, you know, so it's baseband in the sense that I'm around zero in terms of spectral content. But I do have a small carrier frequency here at baseband. So the filter that I want to use is bandpass. And why bandpass? Bandpass filter centered at FC. Why bandpass? I want the spectral content near the, the carrier frequency. In other words, I want to pass the transmission band and attenuate frequencies outside the transmission band. Noise, interference, whatever happens to be outside the band. We did a homework problem on this some time ago, improving SNR by applying a bandpass filter. So this gets rid of, or at least reduces, the out-of-band interference. But I still got a lot of stuff in band I got to take care of. Additive noise, perhaps some interferers, lots of stuff I still have to clean up in the transmission band, and I told you we would clean those things up later. Now we're still in continuous time analog, so the next stage here is to get to discrete time digital, I want to go through a, a to D converter. Now this A to D converter has a fixed voltage uh, resolution, or sorry, range, wrong word. So it might be minus three volts to three volt, volts, minus five volts to five volts. There's some voltage range, and I really want my I want to I want to feed in this R of T to fill out that whole voltage range, and the reason for that is ultimately I'm quantizing to a fixed number of bits or levels. All right, so if I'm going to quantize to say, you know, eight levels, something very simple, I'd like to have R of T spread out in amplitude over the whole voltage range so that I fill up all eight levels. I get what comes out is I get I get the bits matter, so. So the bits that say are, if I have eight levels, you know, uh, three bits, I'm going, say, from, uh, basically I'm covering minus three to three with, say, eight levels. Or if you might think about it, say, seven levels for simplicity, so every level is a volt. If my gain control, if my gain here were too small and all my voltage got squeezed down into the range from minus half a volt to half volt, I'd only have one quantization level coming out. What I'd rather have is the right gain here, C of T, so that I cover minus 3 volts to 3 volts. I don't want to go minus 5 to 5 because I get clipping. I want to be in the range of the quantizer. So there's a feedback system here that looks at the output of the A to D converter to make automatic gain control decisions for future samples. We want to stay 
in the range minus 3 to 3 and fill out minus 3 to 3 volts, or whatever the range happens to be. Okay. Uh, there's also carry detection, which we'll talk about, but briefly, this is to figure out when there's a connection that is about to happen, if there isn't one currently. If there is a current connection, uh, is that connection been discontinued? Has it been hung up or whatever? So it's going to detect basically some energy detection block is all this is. Is there a lot of energy coming at me in the transmission in the transmission band? Because I've already used this receive filter to to pass frequencies in the transmission band and attenuate those outside the transmission band. So the carry detection can be as simple as just detect energy across the whole transmission band, not just at one carrier frequency. Equalizer, its job is to um, compensate for the frequency distortion in the channel. So now if we look at our channel models back here, so the next thing would be an LTI model. Number three, number four, LTI plus noise. And you can keep going with your channel models to get more and more complicated. Right? You start with the simplest to make sure your receiver's working in the simplest case. Then you go to the next case, additive noise, LTI model, LTI plus noise. And you can keep going. You can keep adding all kinds of... All right, so this is back to lecture 12 when we talked about channel models. Okay, so the equalizer is going to correct for any sort of linear time invariant or linear time varying. If we make the equalizer adaptive, then we can handle linear time varying impairments. So once, now also on the bottom of this is a feedback loop to do symbol clock recovery. Okay, we've, you know, we had, we looked at this in lab, so there's going to be some feedback, and this feedback is either going to advance or delay the next time a symbol, uh, um, uh, sorry, in this case a sample is taken. So we're going to adjust the, the clock that feeds into the A to D converter either to advance it or delay it slightly. And this will allow us to um, line up our samples with start of symbol periods and have L, sam L samples per symbol period. So we want to get the, the sampling not only at the right time, but the right rate. So we'll talk about that in this lecture slides. One method for this. And you looked at pre-emphasis for this in lab. I can lock onto the symbol, uh, symbol clock. Okay, so that's all, that's a lot of that. So that's a lot of stuff on the front end before we even get to QEM demodulation. So if you pick up a, some communication theory textbooks, they go right to QEM demodulation, assuming that all this stuff on the front end is working in the metaphysically perfect world, which of course we don't have. So we're going to talk about what really happens. And as you might imagine, it's not ideal or metaphysical. It's going to be quite, quite difficult to get these adaptive systems quite right. If they're excellent and doing a pretty good job, or at least doing a pretty good job, not, not again, the ideal case, then the QAMD modulation is going to give us meaningful results. So, the, so what do we do in QAMD modulation? We're going to do the dual of what happens in the transmitter, the baseband transmitter. So we're going to, instead of modulation, so the, the dual of the modulation step would be the demodulation step, which is multiply by a uh, cosine for the upper channel and then low pass filter. The dual of the pulse shaper is the, also the, this low pass filter, again, playing three roles. The uh, dual of upsampling by L is downsampling by L. And so what comes out of the signal path is now an estimate of the in phase and quadrature amplitudes that the transmitter had transmitted. And we know that, that if everything is right with all the front end, all the signal path and all the adaptive elements here, is, if things are pretty accurate, then what we're going to see in these estimates of the symbol amplitude, simply the transmitted symbol amplitudes plus noise. All right, that's what we derived in lecture 15 for QAM symbol error probability. So what we derived there was a bound to say, how good could it be under all these ideal assumptions? What's the lowest it can be? And what will happen in reality is it will be worse than that. But at least we know how good it could be so that when we're designing these different subsystems for equalization or whatever, we'd like to be able to get as close to that bound as we can. And we can also compare two algorithms, say, to do equalization to show which one of us gets, which one of those algorithms gets closer to the bound that we've derived and make a choice accordingly. 
And we could also include complexity to figure out, okay, I have two methods. One's more complex, but gets us closer to the bound. One's less complex, but gets us farther away from the bound. And you have to make a trade-off based on how much complexity you're willing to spend on the equalizer in your system. Okay, a lot of stuff here, so pause for any. Go ahead. Uh, how would I do that? So the question was, how do I how do I put the chain equalizer into the transmitter? The short answer is uh, yes. You would pre-filter the signal at the transmitter prior to transmission. And and yes, we do this. By the way, it does happen. It's called pre-pre distortion. And but how would you do that? What does the transmitter need to know? Right, so I'm going to have to have feedback. So I have two choices. So here's the problem. I, the, the, re, the reason it's difficult to do is that the receiver is going to design the channel equalizer based on the knowledge of the channel. How does it get that knowledge? The transmitter sends a pseudo-noise sequence or some training signal over the channel, and the receiver learns and updates the channel equalizer based on this training data. And then when I send message data, I can further adapt based on feedback from the estimated in phase and quadrature symbol amplitude. So there are lots of ways I can do that. Now, this will work. So you could do pre distortion at the transmitter. So it depends. So if you have much more processing power on the transmit side and not as much on the receive side, then you'd rather move as much as you can to the transmit side. So that's a case where you would like to move the pre distortion to the transmit side. Now, you, but you need. You either need the receiver to feed back channel estimates, which is one way to do it, on a, on a low rate control channel, and let the pre distortion, the, the, the equivalent block in the transmitter adapt. There's a feedback delay, as you might guess, to do that. Another solution, which is in use, that, is, that one is in use, although it's not, as you might guess, there's some communication overhead to make that happen. Another way to do it is to do time division multiplexing. So the transmitter sends, receiver receives, and then the transmitter goes quiet. And the transmitter on the receiver end then transmits. And if you transmit over the same bandwidth uh, and you use, uh, you use a different time slot, then what you can use is the channel estimate coming back the other way for your pre-distortion. We call this reciprocation. Okay, and that's a com that is used in wireless communications for this reason. That way. I can do the pre-distortion on the, on the transmit side if I want to. All right. So again, if I have like a, you know, it's not necessarily this way, but think about a base station having lots of power and the handset not having as much, or a Pico cell having more than the handset. So you could offload some work on the, on the base station. It's not that simple in the, in the standards, but I'm, in principle, right, if I got a lot more on the transmit side, then let's go ahead and use all that processing power. Any other questions on this? Okay, so the pre-distortion thing with channel feedback works really well when you don't have to give much feedback. So if the channel is only changing on the order of every second, then you don't need to do a lot of training, and the feedback doesn't have to happen very often. If your channel is changing in on the microsecond time scale, then that feedback is just going to kill you with overhead. It's not that so recipro reciprocity might make some sense when you have a very fast uh, changing channel. All right, let's do automatic gain control. Jump into this. So that we're going to pick off just that first piece of the front end there after the receive filter. So again, our job in the in the automatic gain control is to scale the input voltage so that I match the the voltage range of my quantizer in the analog to digital converter. So if I have a low signal level, so if R1 of T is really low relative to that range, then I want to increase the gain. And if if R1 of T is uh, really high, uh, you know, beyond three volts. Or beyond, or beyond minus three volts, either way, that I want to decrease the gain. Okay, so it's going to be adaptive, and I have to figure out an update rate. So I could update 
every, every sample time, I could update every symbol time. Or I could do it every 10 symbol times. I have to figure out what the update rate needs to be. So this, what I'm going to be next is a test question from a midterm. And I'm going to give you the student answer on this one, because the student answer was better than mine. So I'll give you the student answer on this one. All right, so consider an ADD converter output with 8-bit, an ADD converter with 8-bit signed output. So in this particular case, it means that I get 8 bits per sample coming out of the A to D converter. And if I look at a few things, so if the gain is 0, C of T is 0, the output of the A to D converter would be 0. Or whatever quantize, it would be 0 in level. If uh, C of T were infinity, then the A to D output would, would always be either minus 128 or 127, right, for 8 bits signed. All right, so it's 8 bits signed. My, level, my amplitudes are from minus 128 to 127, right, 8 bits signed. So if the C of T were infinity, then R of T is going to be either plus or minus infinity. And that means that I'm going to be outside the range, so I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, clipping to the nearest level, which is either 127 if it's plus infinity or minus 128 if it's minus infinity. So we can actually develop a very nice um, adaptive algorithm to adapt C of T, the gain value in the automatic gain control loop, with just three counters. So this is, this is all part of the problem set up. So if we have three counters, which is I look at what comes out of the A to D converter, and I keep track of how often I see a value at 0, a value at 127, and a value at minus 128. These are the extreme points, minus 128, 127. That's the extreme case when C of T is too large. The extreme case when C of T is too small is the frequency count of 0. Okay, so if I look at these three points, I can use knowledge of those three points to figure out do I need to increase or decrease, or maybe I don't make any change to the gain. It's just right. So I, so this is just a counter. I just count how many times I see 120, minus 128, 0, 127, and then to get a frequency, I can simply divide by the number of observations, number of samples that I've observed. And I would do that over some period of previous samples. I wouldn't do it over all time. I might... Just go back over the previous you know, 100 samples or whatever I need, 1,000 samples, whatever accuracy I want. So I have to buffer. I have to have a buffer here at the output of the A to D, three buffers, right, previous values. All right, so each frequency value is between 0 and 1 inclusive. And, here's the, and I asked for an update. So the midterm question was, can you come up with a formula to update the gain? And you see, so you have to... So you have to Two things you have to come up with. One is how often do I update? And you can defend, you know, really anything. It really, I didn't give you enough in that problem to know how fast to update it. So here I'm updating at some time constant tau. That time constant could be, I think in this problem that was the symbol time. But it could be the sample time. It could be really any time scale that makes sense for the problem. And... So if I look at this for just a second, and I think, well, you know, if, if I get too many hits on f of minus 128 or f of 127, it means my gain's too high. I need to reduce it. If I get a lot of hits on f of 0, it means my gain's too low. I need to increase it. So I need to come up with a mathematical expression that relates to that. So again, if f naught is really large, then I'm going to increase, with the plus sign here, the, the, the current gain. I'm going to increase the, the last gain I had. I'm going to increase it. If f of minus 128 is too high, remember this is a value between 0 and 1 inclusive. Can't be any greater than 1, can't be less than 0. So if I'm, if I, you know, if I'm seeing lots of hits at minus 128, then I want to decrease the gain. That's the minus sign. And if I look at the worst case, look some extreme cases, I get, let's say, 0. So extreme case here, let's say this, this were 0, this were 0, um, which means I'm not seeing the extreme points. Then this is going to go up 
by this factor, whatever that factor is. Okay. Now, if I'm not seeing any f of 0 and I'm seeing everything at f of minus 128 and 127, then I'll, I'll, I'll decrease. Remember, the sum of all these frequencies can't be any greater than 1. Okay, so I'm never going to go negative here. And I got to pick some initial values, so I could, you know, lots of ways I could do that, but I could just say every, you know, initially we'll just say everything's uniformly uh, equal and adapt from there to reasonable. But you could also initialize them to zeros because you won't, you won't compute the frequencies until you've buffered a certain number of samples. So you just set them all to zero if you want initially. My answer was to divide. My answer was to do this. So this is a student answer. And I really like the student answer because it was easy to differentiate and easy to come up with an adaptive algorithm by descending an error surface. Because now the adaptive algorithm just depends on, you know, it's just the derivative. So this derivative of f naught, these are separate when I take the derivative and, and go. My solution, which was incredibly uh, uh, which was fine in principle, but it had two real problems with it. It would work to a certain extent. That's the way I chose to do it. Now, there are some real some issues there. One is you've got to initialize the values right, otherwise you get divided by zero. So you do risk division by zero. Uh, second, write that a little better. The second uh, is it's hard to differentiate. difficult to differentiate that. I mean, it's doable. It just gets messy. But this works. I mean, so it, it, it does the same thing. So the, this would be the gain. So basically you're saying, you know, that, that C of T, so this is my gain. This is, this is my scaling that as a function. This is my gain. This is my adjustment, I should say. So I had C of t was equal to this times C of t minus tau. This one is, uh, is, has erratic behavior because of the division. So I can get very large and small values over very small time scales. It's not a very smooth uh, change in gain, in adjustment of gain. So it works, so, I mean, it would work to some extent, but this one's much better. The one the students came up with is just much better. At a what? At a constant? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So if you were to really make this numerically um, better behave, then you would add, you could add an epsilon uh, to numerator and denominator. And that would, some small positive value just to prevent division by zero. Exactly. Now, it's okay if f naught goes to zero. That's okay. The problem is that when the denominator goes to zero, you're right. So we can add a small out constant offset, 10 to the minus 3 or something. 10 to the minus 4. Just to make sure that it's, it doesn't, so you, don't, you don't bias. You don't bias. That's right. So you could, do, you could do this. Right. So you add the same small constant to prevent division. So you could do plus epsilon plus epsilon 10 to the minus 3 or something. All right, thanks. Have a good weekend. Pick this up on, on Monday. Well, because you're...